We're going to have a Bible study here. 2 Corinthians, final greetings, chapter 13, the, the last chapter of 2 Corinthians. We're going to start at verse 11, and we'll go through it quickly. Finally, take that one word. What is, what is Paul saying, finally? He's saying, you could take that in one way to mean when all is done and said, finally, this is how you should live. Every day, he's about to tell us how we should daily live as Christian believers. How should we live daily as Christian believers following Jesus Christ? This letter is not written, well, this part of the letter is not written to non-believers. Now, I'm sure in the rest of the book, Paul goes over how you should believe and all the benefits and what happens if you don't. But in the final greetings, he's speaking to the believers only. Now, listen. And he's telling us how to live daily. What kind of an attitude you should have towards other believers. You know... You can quarrel with the world. Sometimes you have to. You don't have a choice. But you should never, ever be quarreling with other Christians. Okay. Brothers and sisters. That's what it is. Fellow Christians. You can't call someone your brother or your sister unless you are part of their family. Well, in this case, you are part of the saved forgiven spiritual family of Jesus Christ. God the Father and now all the other Christians are actually now our brothers and sisters. They have become our brothers and sisters in Christ and on the cross. We all have this in common. Okay. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice! Explanation mark. What is Paul saying? You should be walking around rejoicing all the time. You say, well, you know, I got a flat tire. I had to buy some new tires. Rejoice in the name of Jesus. You had the money to pay for them. Rejoice. You got your tire fixed. You see, there's really no excuse for going outside of this word rejoice. You know, when God says rejoice, I mean, what excuse can you give him? When Paul the Apostle says rejoice in the name of Jesus, I mean, what excuse do you really have? Well, dear Father in heaven, I can't rejoice right now because I'm, I got a lot of work to do. I got to go to school. I'm a young person. I can't, I'll rejoice when I get out of school because I hate school. I can't rejoice now because my house was just flooded from all this rain in Northern California. That's not what it says. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. It just slaps it right in your face. And you have a personal decision to make. Are you going to live in this rejoicing, thankful, grateful attitude? Or are you only going to rejoice at times when things are 100% perfect and going your way? Now, here's the catch-22. Going the way you believe things should go. It still doesn't even mean they're the correct way. It just means what you personally believe. You may be wrong about things. Strive for full restoration. My goodness gracious, the next, these two things put together are profoundly some of the wisest things ever told to, um, you know, a saved Christian throughout all human history. First, he says, rejoice. And second, here's something you do not hear in our society. Strive for full restoration. Strive for full restoration. What does full restoration mean as a Christian? Now, you notice it doesn't say strive for part restoration or you've been restored enough. Paul's not saying, hey, hey, you know, you got rid of five of the ten bad things you used to do before you became saved. 
That's not what he's saying. Full restoration. Being fully, whatever your sins were before, when you were unrestored, before you got on your knees and begged God for forgiveness through Jesus Christ, now you're saved. Now you're a Christian. Now you read the Bible. Are they saying that's good enough? That's enough. No, they're not. They're saying strive daily for full restoration. What does that mean? When those old sins come back to you and say, hey, why don't you come have some more fun with us like you used to in the past? Say, no, thank you. I'm striving to be fully restored. As says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, strive for full restoration. A lot of Christians I know will have problem with that. Then it says, encourage one another. Be of one mind. That's why there should be no arguing amongst Christians. If you got a Christian who's having a bad day, well, then you don't, don't argue with them. Just keep your mouth shut. Just close your mouth and don't say anything. Did you ever hear of just quietly praying for the person? They're having a bad day. You're not supposed to make it worse by arguing with them. Because that's not, you know, what Jesus had in mind for us after we become saved. Be of one mind. Live in peace. There you go. Boy, if the world could get that today... God might come down here in five minutes if the whole world could just live in peace in the name of Jesus. It's obviously not going to happen because the devil is roaming back and forth like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's looking for someone to kill, steal, and destroy from. And let me back up. The devil is trying to steal your full restoration. He's trying to convince you like he did Eve in the Garden of Eden that, you know, well, just eat the apple, it'll be okay. You'll just kind of live a, a subhuman life after you sin, kind of. You know, pulling weeds the rest of your life isn't that bad. Yeah, I'd like to see him do it. But let me tell you, the devil is here to steal away, steal away from you the full restoration that Jesus Christ is trying to give you as a Christian. Do you know what it would be like to be fully restored in Christ? Now, you are technically, spiritually, all your sins have been forgiven. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about daily actions, choices, words. I'm talking about making cho the choices you make your mind is fully restored, all new. You're living this whole new life. You can't even believe how amazing it is. Jesus is teaching you, you used to live like a sinner against God. Now we're going to fully restore you and you're going to live for God. Oh, you don't know what you've been missing, Christian, I'm telling you. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Did you hear what that just said? The God of love. See, we are serving a God of love as his children. He loves us. He sent his only son to die on the cross for our sins. And that is how you are supposed to live. The God of love and peace be with you. Blessed are the peacemakers, says the Bible. Well, God is the first peacemaker. You say, well, what about the Old Testament? God destroyed a lot of people. No, nope, they destroyed themselves. God gave them every opportunity, even the most sinful, vile nations. You don't know what he was doing with those people before the Israelites showed up. He was giving them chance after chance after chance to follow him, and they rejected him also for, you know, hundreds of years. And then the destruction came because of their own behavior. They were not living to be fully restored. They were living for sin pleasure, one pleasure after another through sinful behavior. Greet one another with a holy kiss. 
Well, that's fine. You can't do that today, really. It'd be nice, you know. But you can do it in spirit. But Christians today don't go up kissing each other. Well, especially with the virus. We all got on mass. You see, that's a good that's a good point. That's what the devil took from us, you see. But people don't greet each other by kissing on the cheek anymore. No. We're supposed to be loving each other wholly and fully through God. But, you know, in today's society, you'd be kissing 30, 40 people before you went in the store. We live in a society that just does not allow that. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying we live in a society that if you try to kiss someone you think it's a Christian, they're going to sue you for sexual harassment because we live in the last days in a fallen world. So my advice to you is don't go around greeting people by kissing them. Or you're going to um, cause a lot of problems in your own personal life. I'm not saying the Bible is wrong. I'm saying we are screwed up here in the last days. Let us go on. All God's people here send their greetings. See, Paul, you think he's writing these letters. No, he wrote them on behalf of the church. Through the Holy Spirit. So actually God was telling him exactly what to write through the Holy Spirit. People say the Bible was written by man. Wrong. 100, 1,000% wrong. The Bible was not written by man, my friends. The Bible was written by the hand of God before one man was ever created. But if, you're, if you haven't been a Christian very long, you have to go a while to figure that out. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, I want to say that one more time. How do they describe Jesus Christ here? Grace. May the grace of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. How do they describe God, the Father? And the love of God. And how do they describe the Holy Spirit? And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, I want to concentrate on the Holy Spirit. Do you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit? A lot of Christians have never received the Holy Spirit. I believe they are saved. I believe they are going to heaven. They have never received the Holy Spirit. They haven't made a, a lot of big changes in their life. They don't read the Bible. They don't ask for the Holy Spirit. They don't ask to have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit come in and take over their life. If you need more information on that, ask your your local Christian minister, pastor, they, they will sit down with you as long as you need to understand it or they'll give a sermon in the church and explain it. It takes a long time to explain what the Holy Spirit is, what the duties of the Holy Spirit is, what the purpose of the Holy Spirit is. I can't um, get into it right now. All as I know, I can tell you this, when you have the Holy Spirit, you can see around corners. You want superpowers? You want to watch Batman and Spider-Man on the stupid TV and the stupid movies? You think Iron Man has powers? Huh. Jesus said, I will leave and I will ask the Father to send you the Holy Spirit, which is out of God. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, you want to talk about superpowers, my friend. The Holy Spirit's give you superpowers. Now, that's a funny way to put it in our society, but it's just so you'll understand it. By receiving the Holy Spirit, you can see around corners. You can see over a mountain. You can, um, and you don't even have to be there. You can um, predict the future. You can prophesy. You can have dreams. You see, God uses the Holy Spirit to talk directly to you, his new child, his child now. You have no idea, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, what you're missing. 